Hey everybody, good morning or good afternoon or good night, I don't know. Welcome to the uh, online gathering of the Pathways Church community. My name is Nick and we want to uh, welcome those of you out there in Facebook land and on YouTube for uh, joining us here uh, today. We're glad that you have found us and those of you who are kind of familiar with this group, you sort of know the drill of what we do here as we are gathered together. Um, but for those of you who are new to this space, we want to welcome you and just give you a little bit of a heads up of what to expect. We are a uh, church community uh, who meets both online here and uh, in person. We have people who meet together in person uh, in Everett, Washington, uh, but we also have people really all over the country and indeed all over the world who meet up with us in this space uh, online uh, because we are a church that isn't really so much about a geographic location as a certain mindset. And so uh, perhaps you might fit in well with this group. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, uh, you can do so by going to our website at findpathways.com, or you can, uh, as you're there, check out some of our core values. We have them listed in the bottom corner of the screen here uh, to give you a little idea of some of the things that we value on this journey uh, together that we are taking. And uh, these might be things, again, that you might live in some different geographical area, not in the Pacific Northwest, but you might be looking for a church uh, that values some similar things that you do. And uh, you can read up on our website a little bit more about who we are. Now, we like to describe ourselves with two words. Those of you who've been around for a while, uh, you know my little spiel each week. But uh, it's just a simple way to introduce ourselves uh, with the words cautious and curious. We are a cautious bunch when it comes to religion in general. Uh, we're uh, kind of cautious because we, many of us have grown up in religious contexts. I mean, Hard not to when you live in the United States, uh, you are surrounded by uh, particularly Christianity. And uh, so many of us have grown up in that or been surrounded by it. And we've seen religion used in some good ways, but uh, we've also used uh, seen religion used in some ways that were not good, that were abusive, that were hurtful, weaponized, um, uh, weaponizing religion against other people. And so uh, many of us are kind of cautious and skeptical about organized religion. And you say, well, that's kind of weird because I thought this was a church and you seem to be fairly organized. And uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, so we do live in this kind of weird tension of uh, uh, an organized, you know, church group, but also a little cautious and uh, a little skeptical of organized religion. Now, also, we are a group, though, that's very curious. We like to ask a lot of questions. That's probably why we're curious of a lot of established religion, because often in those environments, you can't ask a lot of questions. And so we try to foster an environment where it's okay to ask questions. And we actually mean it. Uh, we don't really have any topics that are off limits. And we think it's worthwhile uh, to ask uh, lots of questions. We think that's actually uh, what makes for a vibrant faith is to ask questions, to rethink things, to maybe come to new conclusions as you get new evidence, all that type of stuff. So if you find either of those words interesting, cautious, or curious, uh, you might have found a really good group here with us. Now, uh, a couple things. Uh, again, if you've been around a bit, you kind of know the drill here, but what we're going to be doing is our worship leader, Billy, is going to be coming on the screen here. Uh, he's going to lead us in a couple songs, and sandwiched in between that is sort of a reflective video, and that's to just sort of waken us up today uh, to uh, the fact that God is with us everywhere that we go. And uh, then after that, I'm going to come back and uh, we're doing a series on the Bible, kind of what is it? We're deconstructing some uh, perhaps previous notions we had about the Bible and reconstructing some new ones. And uh, so I'll be sharing with us another major problem of the Bible today that we are going to look at. And then at the end, I'm going to provide a place for us to kind of go to the communion table. And uh, this will have to be in our online spaces. It's sort of a self-guided tour. Um, so in our in-person gatherings, we supply, you know, the bread and the cup and we take those together. But here online, uh, you'll need to scrounge up a couple things on your own if you'd like to participate. Uh, maybe go through the pantry there. Find some crackers or uh, a piece of bread, uh, just a little bit of bread, and then find something for the cup. It can be juice, it could be some wine left over from last night, uh, whatever you got there. They're two symbols. They represent the body and the blood of Jesus, and uh, Christians for thousands of years have taken these upon Jesus' requests uh, to remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and so we do that each week, and if you want to join us in that, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, okay, that's pretty much it for the introduction here. I'm going to turn it over to Billy. He's going to lead us through uh, a couple songs here, and then I'll jump back on with you as we continue our series. Okay, take it away, Billy.
my heart is so overwhelmed And I cannot hear your voice I'll hold on to what is true Though I cannot see If the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe I'll remind myself of all that you've done And the life I have because of your son Cause love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free And I am yours promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me staying desperate for you God staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands in praise I will believe I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. Cause love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. I am forever yours. Bouncing high and valley low. I'll sing out with my, my soul. down and set me free I am yours I am forever yours mountain high and valley low I'll sing out remind my soul that I am yours I am forever yours cause love came down and rescued me love came down I am.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, Praise forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Till that soul was moved for good, for the Lamb and conquered death. And the dead were from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church was Christ was born, then see lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me.
I do believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is true. That doesn't mean I believe that every story in scripture is historical or scientific, or that we can only learn truths from science and history. I think stories can speak really powerful truths into our lives. So with the Bible, I think a lot of people approach the Bible as a conversation ender. You know, you see the bumper stickers, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I think that the Bible with all of its tensions and conflicts and competing voices and perspectives invites us into conversation with one another. I believe the Bible's meant to be a conversation starter, not a conversation ender. Um, and I think the Jewish community has done a much better job of preserving this notion of scripture as a conversation starter. Uh, I have an Orthodox Jewish friend named Ahava, and I heard from Ahava not long ago. She was telling me about how her husband's a rabbi, so they had a bunch of other rabbis over to their home um, to talk and they, she said oh they were debating the Torah uh, the conversation went on and on nobody could seem to agree on the meaning we started to run out of food and oh Rachel she said it was wonderful because <laughs> she knew that that text was what drew them into community together it gave them something to talk about and I think the Bible being people of faith isn't just about being right about things being people of faith is about being part of a community and the Bible invites us into community precisely because it's difficult to understand, precisely because it doesn't have a single apparent clear meaning. Uh, the Bible invites conversation. Oh, that's great. Rachel Held Evans there, uh, just letting, reminding us here that the Bible does isn't the, uh, the end of the conversation. It's the beginning. It's the conversation starter, inviting us into a conversation. And that is what we are going to talk about today as we get going here on our series again. Now, uh, last week we were off. We had like an in-person discussion time, which was really good, by the way. We were talking about a lot of things we've been talking about here uh, and in person in this series, and we had a chance to kind of uh, ask questions and dialogue in groups together about some of these things, and it was uh, uh, hugely beneficial, and we'll do another one next month, and uh, I would encourage you, if you're an online person and you live locally somehow, uh, those are really worthwhile to come to. We're trying to do them on the third weekend uh, of every month, and so we'd love to have you join us if you want to do that. Uh, now, there's a big thing in my house right now, and that uh, is, well, always video games. My kids love video games, but the Nintendo Switch has just sort of taken over uh, my children's hearts, right? Uh, they just love their Nintendo Switches. They're they're phenomenal devices. They're incredible. I mean, uh, they can plug into your TV or you can hold it in your hand. It's just incredible. And I know that feeling because when I was a kid, I was in love with Nintendo too. It wasn't nearly quite as cool of a Nintendo uh, as they have today. In fact, it had to stay plugged into your TV. Uh, it had a cord. And you remember those little cartridges? You had to like blow on the cartridge even to get it to work. Uh, but I loved my original Nintendo. And one of the things I discovered pretty early on uh, is that I had a friend introduce me to a little thing called the Nintendo Game Genie. And I got this Game Genie for my original NES. And uh, this little thing would clip on uh, to those cartridges that uh, worked only half the time. But the thing about this Game Genie is that it gave you all the extra shortcuts and cheats. So you could play these games uh, way ahead, right? With already like um, unlimited lives or whatever you needed. And so it was easier to win. It was like kind of all these shortcuts that made every game easier. And I like shortcuts, don't you? I mean, I just love shortcuts. I like, I like life hacks, you know, where someone say, hey, here's a good life hack, you know? And that's what the Game Genie was. It was a video game life hack and it was just so great it was kind of like uh you know when you're in school and you had all the answers to the odd math problems in the back of your book you knew you could always get half correct right because you had those answers in the back now when i was in church growing up sunday school i had a well-meaning sunday school teacher uh, who was trying to be hip and knew about the whole game genies and the nas stuff that was going on back then uh this well-meaning sunday school teacher trying to be hip explained to me that the Bible was like a game genie. Uh, it was like the game genie to life. It gave you the easiest, best way to do life. 
Uh, it had all the answers. It was like a math textbook, maybe, you know, with all the answers in the back. It was just, the Bible is a giant cheat sheet for life. Uh, you don't have to struggle with any sort of moral dilemmas or problems. You just go to the Bible and get all of your moral quandaries answered. Now, there's several problems of thinking of the Bible this way, and that's what we are going to talk about today. Now, we're doing this series called Construction Zone uh, and the Bible, and we are going to be doing several series of construction zones, uh, several seasons of it, rather, in this series, and we're going to be taking a look at many different topics, but we're starting with the Bible itself, and we're asking some questions because we're noticing some things that maybe we didn't know before, um, and we are trying to take a little time here to carve out some moments to reassess what the Bible material actually is. Not just to get to know the stories in the Bible, but to discuss what is this collection of material in the first place. And what we've been doing here involves uh, really two things. It involves some deconstruction, where we're tearing some things down, we're getting rid of some old ideas that maybe aren't working anymore. Frankly, maybe they never did. But we're also doing some reconstruction. Uh, we're building some new ideas, finding new ways to embrace uh, the Bible in ways that might make more sense or work for us today. And we noticed over the last couple weeks uh, a few problems with the Bible text. And some of you said, I didn't know there were any problems with the Bible. I had someone come to me and say, that's crazy. I didn't notice all that. We used a little story of David and Goliath that many people are familiar with. And we pointed out that uh, there are some human errors and inconsistencies in stories in the Bible, right? You remember we did a whole message on that. And if you didn't get to watch it, uh, you can go back in the archives on Facebook or YouTube and check that out. Uh, another problem, not just human errors or inconsistencies. Another problem we discovered is that the Bible has significant overlap with other ancient stories, many of which are older than the Bible itself. Uh, another major problem we discovered is that the Bible contains a pre-modern view of the world. Uh, people thinking that the sky was actually an ocean being held back by a clear dome that was keeping the ocean from falling down on our heads. And this is clearly not how it is clearly how not how we understand the world working today. It contains a pre-modern view here of how the world works, and it's never refuted or challenged in the Bible. It's just assumed that that's the way things work. Uh, another problem we notice that there are things that are told as history that uh, archaeology and other information tells us may not exactly be historically accurate. Okay, so we notice all these different problems with the Bible, but one more I want to throw at us in kind of several parts here, starting with part one today, is one more category of problems, and that is specifically morality in the Bible. Now, often we think of the Bible as where to go to get moral clarification on something. <laughs> is this good? Is this bad? Let me flip open the Bible and find the answer to whether or not this is good or bad. But I'd like to point out here today uh, that there is a problem with going to the Bible as a sort of moral answer cheat sheet, okay? Because what we're going to discover today is it's sort of messy and inconsistent. Now, we're going to look at another problem of morality in the Bible, which has to do with specifically when God orders things to happen that don't seem uh, morally very good, or when people engage in things uh, that God never appears to condemn that don't seem morally good. But what I'd like for us to address today is just the general idea of going to the Bible as a moral cheat sheet. And there are several problems with this, okay? So let's take a look at morality in the Bible. Now, first of all, there are some things, um, some parts of the morality that we see in the Bible that we would easily agree with, okay? Let's just get this part out of the way right away, right? Uh, when we read the Ten Commandments, it says, don't kill other people, don't steal their stuff, uh, don't covet, you know, love your uh, love your neighbor as yourself, you know. Some of that stuff doesn't need a lot of qualification. We just kind of read it and we say, good, that all sounds good. We agree. Uh, it seems relevant. Uh, it still seems pretty good to us. And it's easy for us to agree to some of those things. And so we could probably just on the surface here easily say that there's some stuff that we agree with today. But what I'd like to point out here is that it isn't all like that. But let's give an example of something that we probably agree with. For instance, Exodus 21 verse 20 says, Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies, slave dies as a direct result. Now I'd say, hey, I agree with that, right? If you uh, have somebody in your employment, or in this case a slave, and you beat them, and, and uh, they are 
uh, killed as a result of it, that you should probably face some sort of punishment. I mean, wouldn't you say that you agree with that? I mean, I think we'd all sign up and say, yes, that seems like a good rule. Uh, we agree with that. But that sort of brings us to the next category of morality in the Bible, and that is some of the morality in the Bible we currently disagree with. And the reason I brought up Exodus 21, verse 20, is so that I could also read us the following verse, Exodus 21, 21. If we start at the beginning, anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. That's the part we agree with. But in the very next verse, it says, but they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Huh. Wow. Well, seems like I agree, and I hope you probably agree with verse 20, but would any of us agree with the morality in the command found in verse 21? I mean, that if you beat your slave with an inch of his life and he just happens to live, that there's no sort of punishment for you? Well, he lived, so no harm, no foul. I mean, are you going to agree with that? I mean, I don't think there's ever a good reason to beat a slave or any person. And if you do, there should be consequences no matter how quickly they recover. And if you think that too, I'd just like to point out that you are disagreeing with part of the Bible, that you are disagreeing with some of the morality law found in the Bible. And you say, I know. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You say, okay, well, that was the Old Testament, but what about the New Testament? Well, uh, we are on the topic of slavery here, and uh, it's important to point out that the New Testament doesn't actually forbid slavery. Now, it gives us some instructions on how to behave in slave and master relationships, and uh, it gives us some ways to do that better, and that is better, but most of us, at least I hope, would still say that slavery is immoral in its essence, that we just shouldn't own other human beings. And sure, you can do slavery in some better ways and in some worse ways, but our overall sense of morality tells us that it really shouldn't happen at all. And so if you think that slavery shouldn't even exist, then you are still arguing with part of the Bible or at least going beyond what it says in terms of morality. Now, I could list a lot of other things here that we would probably disagree with. Uh, the role of women, for instance. Uh, at least certain aspects of the Bible seem to cast women and their role and their authority in, um, in, in ways that seem very regressive to us that we wouldn't agree with today. Uh, we probably wouldn't agree with certain economic structures in the Bible, uh, probably even uh, crime and punishment. We just looked at, at one text, right, in Exodus 21 that had to do with uh, punishment for someone committing a crime, but there's all sorts of other ones, like for instance, if you uh, disobey your parents, that you should be stoned to death. You know, I don't particularly care for when my children disobey what I have to say, but I think I'm going to stop short of stoning them to death. And if you do that, I would hope that CPS would be involved and you would go to jail, right? So there's all sorts of things in the Bible that we disagree with the morality that we find there. But even as we would disagree as Christians today with some of the morality that we read about in the Bible, the Bible itself actually disagrees with other uh, morality forms in the text, right? There's other parts of the Bible that disagree with some of the morality found in it. For instance, uh, intermarriage would be one that would be interesting. We just got done doing a series on the book of Ruth, and you might have remembered that Ruth was not an Israelite. She was a Moabitess. She was not of uh, the tribe of Israel. Uh, she was from another land, Moab, and she intermarries with a prominent Jewish person named Boaz. And this is never condemned. However, if we read Ezra 10, verse 2, it says, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. Uh, so the, what we have here is uh, the prophet of God telling the people that uh, intermarrying with other people groups around them is actually being unfaithful to God. But, of course, we know that uh, Ruth is accepted. Uh, Moses, for crying out loud, marries an Ethiopian, and that's never looked down upon, right? And so, which is it? Can you intermarry or 
not. Another interesting part uh, thing to consider is the idea of divorce. Uh, continuing on with Ezra, verse 3 says, Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in order, in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. In other words, they're saying, let's divorce these women and it's God's preference that we do so. Okay, so here we have divorce being mandated for the people of Israel. But if you read Malachi 2.16, it says the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, so we have one text commanding the people of God to divorce their wives. We have another text commanding the people of Israel not to divorce their wives. So which is it? And why do we have both of these opinions? What are the qualifications? Well, it sort of depends on the book that you are reading. Another great example here would be slavery. Uh, Deuteronomy 23 verse 15 says, If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. Let them live among you wherever they like and in whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. Okay? Now, this is about a slave, perhaps who's run away, escaped from their master. The text says, don't hand them back over to their master. Don't place them back into slavery. But in the New Testament, in Philemon, we have Paul who uh, later... Uh, ref disagrees apparently with Deuteronomy 23 and refuses to follow this rule because in Philemon uh, 1 verse 12 it says I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you I would like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not be seem would not seem forced but would be voluntary perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul is referring to here to a slave who has run away, sought refuge with him, and now Paul is sending him back to his original master. And you think, uh, Paul, did you not read Deuteronomy? You're not supposed to do this. You see, there are often arguments within Scripture itself about what are the morally appropriate things to do. One author has one perspective and another author has a different perspective. And we have to do work to figure out where we are in the material of the Bible and in the trajectory towards Jesus to decide what do we think about these moral issues. Because it's not so easy just to approach the Bible as a moral cheat sheet when we have the Bible text arguing with itself about what the answer is to some of these moral dilemmas. You get it? makes it a little difficult. But what makes it more difficult is sometimes we have things happen in the Bible, some uh, morality that is left ambiguous or not addressed at all. There are some stories in the Bible where the text, the author, doesn't give us their thoughts or God's thoughts on whether or not what is happening is either morally good or bad. It's just sort of left up ambiguous. Uh, a good story this we're going to look at in a week or so is Elisha and these two bears where Elisha calls out two bears to come and maul all these kids and kill them. And the text never says whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But just as a reader, it seems like calling out bears to maul children to death is overall a bad thing. And the text never addresses it. Uh, it doesn't tell us whether it's good or bad. Uh, but here's another great example. And it's the story of Jephthah. Maybe you know this one. It's from Judges 11. It's a story of Jephthah, a warrior, and he makes a vow. It's found in Judges verse 11, and, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. In Jephthah verse 34, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. 
Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. Wow. Well, that's quite a story. And this story of Jephthah here, we have this uh, warrior who is on the battlefield. He's worried about beating his enemies, so he takes a vow to the Lord, like, if you just let me win this battle today, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes out of my house first. And it's a story of human sacrifice, where someone sacrifices a human to God. And you think, hmm, is that morally good? I mean, to win a war here, Jephthah promises God to make a sacrifice. And you think, is first of all, is that how God works? Is, is this bargaining, right? You know, if, if I do this, you'll accomplish this for me. I mean, I guess I'd say no. And then you, you could say, well, maybe he doesn't think it's going to be a person that he has to sacrifice. Maybe he doesn't realize that it's going to be his daughter. I mean, why would he make that sort of vow? But I mean, what else could he expect to come out of the door of his house? And then he decides that he cannot break his vow afterwards. He's made this vow to the Lord and he can't break it. But I mean, are we really to think that God would rather him follow through on the vow and make a human sacrifice to God rather than admit that this whole thing idea had been a bad idea and repent and choose to spare his daughter? And then, apparently, he seems to kill her in the end. And is this pleasing to God? Is God happy that he follows through on this vow and commits murder? Now, what's maybe most disturbing about this text, and there is a lot disturbing in this text, is that the text does not tell us one way or another. The text never tells us this was a good decision, this was a bad decision. The author here does not leave us with any sort of moral information on whether this was good or bad. It's all left ambiguous. And so when we read a story here of something as radical as human sacrifice in the Bible, we aren't given an answer as to whether it's good or bad, which means we have a little bit of work to do. It appears that we cannot just go to the Bible as a simple moral cheat sheet, but we have to take these ambiguous moral texts and somehow use some critical thinking. We need to uh, read them in light of Jesus and with the help of the Holy Spirit and I believe also the voice of our faith communities to decide what do we do with texts like this. And I would say that we have a moral obligation to deal with these texts very carefully and sensitively in light of Jesus, the Spirit, and the voice of the community. And this says nothing about the things that the Bible does not address as far as as morality is concerned, because there are all sorts of things that the Bible does not foresee or address. There are so many things that are never imagined in the Bible text or even discussed. So many things that are moral dilemmas today that the Bible writers don't have to deal with, they don't know about, and so they don't address them. Things like um, medical marijuana use or for that matter, recreational marijuana use. Uh, how about things like uh, in vitro fertilization, right? Helping people who cannot conceive, uh, conceive. Uh, the Bible has no idea, like the people living thousands of years ago, it's not on their radar that that could ever be something that humans could possibly do. Only gods could accomplish things like that. And so what do we do about some of the moral issues surrounding that? Well, the Bible has nothing to say about it because it can't foresee that happening. Uh, what about things like stem cell research? Uh, what about things like artificial intelligence, the creation of it, and then our interaction with it? I mean, playing God in that sense. I mean, the text can't even imagine humans able to build something like that. Uh, maybe even uh, just to throw something out here that's even... Uh, more current, the idea of gay marriage, right? Uh, the, the two people of the same sex could become married together in a lifelong, committed, monogamous relationship. And you say, hold on a second, I know that one's addressed in the Bible. I've read some things uh, that seem like they have to be a critique of that. Well, perhaps 
But you should just know that this modern concept of same-sex couples living in a monogamous, faithful, committed relationship isn't at all what the Bible text is talking about, whether you want to extrapolate that way or not. And so it is imagining something that doesn't even exist in the ancient mind. And so what you have to realize here is the more we think about what the Bible is, the more that we realize it's just not so simple as the Bible gives us all we need to know about how to live moral lives. It is not just a perfect moral answer book. It's not so easy as just find the answers in the back. But I think that's probably good. Now, many of us grew up thinking that the Bible was a perfect moral answer book, that you would just open it up and you'd find the answers to whether something was good or bad. And so this deconstruction process, clearing out the way where we discover that there are some morality problems in the Bible, that it's not just such an easy answer book, may be disturbing as we clear the ground here. But as we just begin to rebuild a little bit of reconstruction here on uh, what the Bible is useful for, let me just suggest that we might want an answer book, but I don't think that's what we actually need. In fact, a Bible like that would probably only stunt our growth. We would rely on it instead of God, and it could easily become an idol or worse and hold us back from our own spiritual growth. Now, I want to take you back here to a minute to that old game genie, okay, to help you understand what I mean. I had the game genie, I put it on my Nintendo, and I would play things like uh, these sports games, uh, like Double Dribble was one of my favorite basketball games, and I would play that at my house, and I put the game genie on there, and I could beat the computer by like a billion points, right? Because it just made it easy. It gave me all the cheat codes and everything. But then I went over to my friend's house, and I started to play an actual person, and I didn't have the game genie. And I just thought I was the best ever at this game, because I would win all the time when I was playing at home alone. But I went over to my friend's house, and I went to play, and he just completely destroyed me. Because... The reason was I didn't know how to play that game without the game genie. I had sort of been cheating the whole time and in cheating I had been winning but you know the old adage you know if you're cheating you're only cheating yourself and I was cheating myself because what had happened was I hadn't been developing the skill for how to play without the game genie. It's like when I would do math I remember in school uh, the answers to the odd problems were in the back of the book. And I would, you know, just snag the answers out of the back of the book and I'd get half right right there and I'd kind of guess on the rest. But I remember as I got older and I got into more difficult math, uh, I took uh, pre-calculus and statistics at one point my junior year and I got half the answers right because I could look in the back of the book, but I didn't know how to do the math because I'd been relying on the cheat code in the back rather than learning how to actually solve the problem problems. And so I fell far behind. And what I'd like to suggest is when we approach the Bible the same way as a moral answer book, that it sort of stunts our spiritual growth the same way. A guy named Tom Stark wrote a book called The Human Faces of God. It's a brilliant little book. And uh, he makes this point in the book saying it this way. An infallible set of scriptures is ultimately just a shortcut through our moral and spiritual development. To have a book dropped from heaven, the likes of which is beyond the reach of all human criticism, that's a shortcut. It is no wonder humans have always attempted to create these kinds of foundational texts, and it's a revelation of God's character, from my perspective, that cracks have been found in each and every one of those foundations. A good teacher does not issue orders one after another and demand assent from her students. A good teacher shows the students how to come to the right conclusions on their own. If God were to have given us an infallible set of answers to our moral questions, God would have been consigning us to moral immaturity and ignorance. That kind of unassailable source of moral knowledge at our fingertips is a way of evading the kind of moral struggle that produces virtuous people and virtuous communities. A book dropped from heaven takes all of the hard work out of it for us. That construct promises us certainty. It promises us hard and fast solutions to moral enigmas. But what it actually delivers is dependence, lethargy, and self-righteousness. This construct is held up as God's very word to us, but it is a cheat sheet. It is the answers in the back of the book, precisely by offering us an unassailable set of moral axioms ready-made 
it removes the necessity of the only thing that can make us moral and virtuous people. And that is struggle. Wow. That's good, isn't it? You get it? You see, it's not that the Bible stunts our growth, but our perception of the Bible might. Our scriptures are an incredible starting point that God speaks through to us, but it doesn't take away our responsibility to use critical thinking and decide what this text actually means for us today. And we already do that on so many issues. Now, it might come as a surprise to you to know that the early church really already did this with multiple things. They approached the Bible as a conversation starter, not a conversation ender. The early church did this with two really major things, uh, circumcision and meat offered to idols, eating meat that had been sacrificed to some other gods or idols. And the Jewish people had Old Testament scripture commanding that people were circumcised and avoiding idolatry. And to eat meat uh, seemed to be to participate in idolatry if it had been offered to an idol. So now the problem is, as the church is expanding and uh, and uh, Christianity is being shared into the Gentile world, the problem is now we have all these Gentiles, these non-Jewish people, who are not circumcised and they're eating all this meat all the time that in their culture is just offered up to all of these idols. And so the church has to figure out what do we do? Because the text tells us they must be circumcised and no idolatry. But what do we do with these people? And in Acts 15, we have James saying, um, you know what? These people don't need to be circumcised in my own judgment, uh, but they should avoid meat offered to uh, idols. And uh, he sent messengers with Paul to deliver a letter stating this uh, to that effect, right? Okay, they don't, need to, they don't need to be circumcised. We can leave that out. They're grown adults. That would be painful and unnecessary. It's a Jewish thing. They don't need to do that. Um, but they still should avoid eating meat offered to idols. Now, there was no text for that. It's just that the people came together, discussed it, and it seemed good to them. But then we get to 1 Corinthians 8, and in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul even goes further and he says, you know what, just go ahead and eat the meat. Not only do these people not need to be circumcised, it's even okay for them to eat this meat that has been offered to idols. And this is pretty incredible because we don't have any Bible text telling us this. In fact, we have Bible text telling us the opposite in the Old Testament. But here we have the first Christians using reasoning, using personal experience, using the help of the Holy Spirit, using a council, you know, a community of other believers, uh, and the scripture itself to decide these moral issues. You get it? They're doing, they're being, they're engaging in the struggle of what it means to decide what is good. There's a great text Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I think this is uh, too often an overlooked verse because Jesus here is saying, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. It, what he's inviting us into here is responsibility. It's like when you get the keys to the car for the first time, you know, and your parent hands you the keys to the car and you say, whoa, it's a lot of responsibility here. And what happens in that moment is there are decisions to make about how you are going to drive the responsibility that you are going to engage in. And it appears here that Jesus is inviting us into to a space where we are getting the keys to the car for the first time. He is inviting us into this decision-making process. You see, the Bible isn't so much a declaration of everything God thinks as much as an invitation to a conversation. As our friend Rachel Held Evans said, it is a conversation starter about God and life and humanity. And you are invited to when you read the Bible material, not only just to read it, but to actually participate in that conversation. 
Now, I can see why we often get bored when we read the Bible, when we think we're just reading a book of rules that someone has handed down to us, you know, uh, some list of answers. And we only open it, of course, when we need to find the answer to something, and we use someone's nice index to find whatever verse we want to find the answer to, our moral quandary. And it's such a trivial way to view the Bible. It's such a low view of Scripture, when Scripture is actually inviting us into a dialogue to wrestle to struggle, to hear the voices of others, to unveil the voice of God, to lean into it with our own experience and thoughts. You see, we don't get all the answers when we open up the Bible like some answers in the back of the book. What we get is pointed to Jesus himself. And he is inviting us to work out those sticky moral issues with him. Now, this is really important. Because we're going to deconstruct all sorts of other ideas, right? We're going to talk about all sorts of different things. Uh, violence and uh, gender roles and LGBTQ theology. And what we're always going to want to do is come back to the Bible and find the answer to a moral problem. But what I'd like us to see here is that we're actually not going to the Bible in order to find an answer. We're going to the Bible as the starting place for our conversation. Because is the Bible perfect, a perfect moral guide with all of the answers in it, a game genie cheat sheet? Of course not. But it is always faithful to invite us into a conversation that points us to Jesus, and he is the perfect word of God. And you remember how Jesus sums up the law. He says he's summing up the law, all these commands, all these rules, all this morality code. To sum it up, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the law for Jesus is summed up by its adherence to doing the thing that is love. And in order to understand whether you're doing something that is love or not, we're going to have to think about it, wrestle with it, struggle with it, get into dialogue with other people about it. We're going to have to listen intently to the Spirit as He guides us. We're going to have to match it up with the life of Jesus and say, is this something that Jesus would do in order to demonstrate love? And this becomes the rule of this text, the rule of love. That's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. And it's a reminder to us uh, that what happens at the cross is really Jesus' demonstration of what love looks like. Uh, we want to go to the communion table this morning, and we want to be reminded of God's great love for us, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We want to be reminded that uh, when we go to the table and we remember Jesus dying, that it was God doing what was uh, needed for us as people. And instead of just coming in and wiping us all out, he dies on our behalf. That He exhibits this type of self-sacrificial, giving love, and that that is the greatest power that there is. We're going to celebrate this morning. Billy's going to lead us in a song here as we go to communion. Let me pray for us, and then uh, if you'd like to take communion with us today, you're welcome to do that. Hey, God, we want to thank you today for the Bible text. Um, uh, thank you for all of its problems. It's um, it's difficult. It makes us wrestle. It makes us struggle. It invites us into the messiness, uh, messiness that we already live in because we are human, but it invites us into this deeper conversation of what does it truly mean to love? And we get to hear the voices of people from thousands of years ago as they interact with the same type of struggles that we had. And now we get to enter into that discussion knowing you, Jesus, the full revelation of who you are, God, and what you are like. And we get to enter into that conversation and participate in what it means to fully love. Uh, help us to approach the Bible text with that kind of um, passion and intensity and curiosity. And as we go to the table this morning, we're reminded uh, that you are a God who always steps into the human condition, that you're not afraid of it, that you step into the messiness of who we are, that you're willing uh, to suffer even in the middle of the chaos that we have created in order uh, to come back to life and offer life to us. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go to the communion table today.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh 
All right, thanks, Billy. Just have a couple announcements here uh, for us. Uh, first of all, I just appreciate that song and the idea we're going to build our life on Jesus. Let's build our faith on Jesus. Uh, some of us, for a while, we built our faith around uh, the Bible text itself, and uh, we put a lot of the weight of our faith on that text. And uh, while that text is beautiful and uh, the conversation starter for all of our discussions, our faith is really built uh, on Jesus alone. And the Bible points, obviously, uh, to Jesus, but we get all of our life and our faith from him alone. So uh, a couple announcements here as uh, we finish up here. Uh, first of all, if you want to give, you can do that. You can go to our website at findpathways.com slash donate, and you can uh, set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift there uh, if you would like to do that. It's a great way um, online to participate in the life of this community. Uh, many of you tune in online regularly and have found some sort of value in what we do here, and a way to really give back is uh, especially online in a financial way to to help us to continue to create these uh, videos. Uh, this whole online thing has sort of created a bunch of extra <laughs> work stuff to get done for that and uh, licensings and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, anyway, if you want to help out that way, uh, that would be great. Uh, another thing that's coming up is one of our um, fellow Pathwaysians, a guy named Dan Merchant. Uh, he's a Pathwaysian, lives out in Spokane and sometimes in Portland. Uh, he has a new show. We like to highlight things that people in our community are doing. And he has a new show that's uh, launching right now called Going Home. It arrives uh, this next week out for streaming uh, on Pure Flix. And if you would like uh, to uh, watch that, uh, it would be fun just to kind of see what Pathwaysian people, uh, people in our community are up to. And uh, I know he'd love for you to tune into that show uh, and check that out. Also, if you want more information on announcements, things that are happening, you can send up our email newsletter. If you don't already receive that, you can send us a message on Facebook or you can uh, email me directly. My email is on the screen there. You can send me a little note and just uh, leave your name and your email address and just say, hey, add me to the newsletter and we would be uh, happy to get you connected that way. Um, all right, uh, we have you know Father's Day coming up in June. We got new theology pubs coming up. We'll kind of announce all those things uh, this uh, next time when we meet together uh, next Sunday. Uh, but that's pretty much it for this week. So hopefully you have a really good uh, weekend. I know it's been schizophrenic out there. Sometimes it's sunny. Sometimes there's a thunderstorm and it's rain and all that stuff too. But uh, hopefully we're going to turn the corner here and get some nicer weather. Uh, we got some stuff planned for the summer. Uh, we have a baseball game we want to go to uh, just as a community. Uh, we got some, uh, some camp out ideas and we'll let you know about that next week as well. And so anyway, have a great weekend and we will talk to you next time. Bye.